Hi, everybody. Francois Picard here with another confined edition of the France 24 debate. It was speaking to a commission of the French parliament that the prime minister, Edouard Philippe, on Wednesday used the word for the first time, deconfinement. The path to ending the lockdown under which France and many of its neighbors are is a long one. And we're going to be talking about it now uh, with our guests, uh, Séverine uh, Troussard, who is a behavioral economist at uh, Oxford University. Thank you for joining us uh, from Oxford. We're going to be talking in a minute uh, about uh, the study that you participated in. Yeah, thanks for having me. We also want to welcome at this point uh, Fabrice Eppelboin. He uh, teaches at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po, and also the co-founder of Yogo Shah, uh, the uh, data security consultancy. Welcome to the show, Fabrice. Thanks for having me. Yeah, the French Prime Minister uh, on Wednesday, as the number of uh, casualties, as the number of those infected from COVID-19 continues to rise for the first time, addressing how we can get out of this confinement. Let's listen. Il est donc probable. Je dis probable et j'essaie de. We're probably not heading towards a universal, absolute end to the quarantine for everyone at the same time. We're currently working on and trying to understand the different scenarios for how to end the quarantine. We should remember that first and foremost, we need to discuss how best to end it. Let me get uh, your reaction, Fabrice Pelboin, to uh, to the Prime Minister, effectively saying that, well, uh, one of the ways we're going to get out of confinement is by being able to track those who have COVID-19. Well, unfortunately for privacy activists like myself, so far, I don't see any other way. So uh, the question is going to be uh, how is this data going to be handled? Uh, what guarantee can we have? And how long is this going to last? And this is a medical question because if it happens to be a seasonal virus like the flu, we're going to be living forever with this kind of technology. So uh, this is a very important moment because this will be a cornerstone. The society after uh, everybody's using this, these kind of app is going to be very different. And of course, uh, they're going to be used for medical reasons in the first place, and they will soon evolve into something else. And this is going to be a, a major problem also. So the sooner we ask the good question, the sooner we we'll might have um, a legislation that will enable this app not to be such a threat to our democracies. All right, we're going to get some of the political reactions to that. But uh, Severin Toussaint, there you hear it, Fabrice Eppelboin, privacy rights activist who's been on with us many times uh, to uh, call out instances where people's rights are being impeded, saying, yes, this is the way to go. And that's what you discovered in the study you conducted across Europe. Yeah. So I really want to say that uh, first, I mean, th there is some uh, trade-off here in terms of how much data we encrypt, how much data we collect, how much, how long we take, uh, we save the data. But uh, Germany uh, uh, tends to be actually very, very much uh, uh, concerned when it comes to privacy uh, for historical reasons. Thinking about you know East Germany and the Stasi, for instance. So they are really, really. Uh, you know, have this in mind very much when we uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, collecting data that would allow to track people's location, for instance. However, um, you know, lawyers, uh, parties, um, the Greens, for instance, uh, the Green Party in, uh, in Germany now really supports this type of uh, um, approach. And, uh, and we'll uh, probably have the occasion to talk more about how we could do this in a way that actually preserves uh, our privacy. Um, but so we've conducted a study um, with an online panel in four different countries, Germany, France, the UK and Italy, with 1000 respondents, basically asking this question, you know, how much uh, would you be willing uh, or what, what would be your chances of actually installing the app if it existed? OK, uh, and we realized that across all these four countries, there is a massive uh, yes in terms of installing such an app. Okay, so we gave a short description of what uh, the app would do. Um, 
and uh, and maybe we can go back to uh, what I'll yeah, do. Yeah, let's talk about that for one second here. Uh, the the app, according to the prime minister, and we heard as well the uh, the head of uh, uh, of digital affairs at the European Commission, Thierry Breton, talk about this. Uh, it would be an app that would run on Bluetooth. And that would uh, that would not uh, store your personal data. Yeah. So so yeah. Let's just look just uh, like what what's the basic principle and what can be done. So here on the, the basic idea is you install an app on your phone, and then uh, the app will recognize other users that are in your environment that you have been in close contact with uh, for at least say fifteen minutes, or what is uh, seems to be a. Uh, uh, relevant from an epidemiological point of view, and uh, close contact meaning, for instance, two meters apart. Okay, and and then uh, if one of the, your close contacts um, was diagnosed with the virus, you would receive a message alerting you that this person got the virus. This person, meaning, I mean, you, you would have an uh, anonymized, uh, you know, ID that would be saved in your phone, so we'd never know who, who, who was this person, what the identity of the person was. But basically telling you, uh, well, please enter in self-isolation, um, protect your family, your loved ones, anyone else you could enter in contact with from getting the virus. And that's actually really important for the following reason, which is that uh, we might actually carry the, uh, the disease and be infectious even before actually feeling the symptoms. Okay. So uh, the fact that we are asymptomatic uh, is actually a big problem for this virus. Okay, and previous versions of this virus did not necessarily have this feature, um, but we can transmit very easily the disease without even knowing it. So the advice of just entering uh, in self-quarantine here seems to be a very important thing to do, trying to be ahead of the curve instead of always being behind. And let, me, let me bring in Fabrice Epelbois on this. How does that sound to you, uh, the, way it's, uh, uh, the way it's sold, if you will, by Severine Toussaint? Actually, it's a bit more complex. For example, uh, we could totally uh, design an app that would bring me anonymous data telling me that I've crossed the path of someone anonymous who has the virus. That's not a major problem. But the, the, the entity who will collect all these apps will have the possibility to de-anonymize anything. This has been proven many times. So whatever the app is, we will hand those data to various entities, states, Europe, or whatever, who will be able to de-anonymize those that. And this is life-changing for our democracies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, trust is going to be incredibly important. Uh, so yes. what type of authority is going to have to deal with this? And there is here really, uh, you know, it's going to be country by country response. That and, and, and that's a very important point. Trust is going to be the cornerstone, both on the tech level and on the political level. For example, Singapore open source its app, and that's a big th thing in terms of trust. But when we come to Europe, uh, not only open source and free software is not really the way to go in Europe, but we have basically two entities. Uh, in France, we have the French state and Europe. And as of today, nobody really trusts those entities. So there will be a major problem in terms of trust especially in France, who is probably the country in the most dire situation when it comes to trust. Let me ask Séverine Toussaint, specifically on that point, uh, how did, what did respondents in France say compared to the other countries? Yeah, so I was incredibly surprised actually by the response that was given by uh, you know, our participants. Obviously there might, might be issues of selection, the fact that we're dealing with an online panel, how we can discuss all these things. But um, when we ask people, you know, so how inclined, how likely would you be to install in this app if it existed? 80% of our respondents said they would probably, or even without any doubt, install the app. Okay. So, uh, so that's the first thing uh, that, that we've realized. The second thing we ask is, suppose now actually there is another policy you could uh, potentially uh, consider, which is automatic installation with the possibility of opting out. And even then, actually, fewer responses uh, actually uh, would want to uh, follow this policy. But nevertheless, a majority said, yes, the government should do this. So I think there is something about the urgency of the situation that you know, makes people really take this into account. And uh, however, I would like to emphasize the following thing, which is we also ask people about whether their op opinion of the government would change uh, if 
you know, such a policy was implemented. And here, the message is much more mixed. Okay, so I think it's incredibly important that uh, there be an, an, uh, an independent authority in charge of this uh, to uh, to actually promote and explain to the public. Uh, so, so let me just ask you a personal question on that, because as a French citizen living in the UK, uh, here in France, what we've witnessed is, is there's been a lot of second guessing of the government uh, since the beginning of confinement. Uh, confinement is more recent where you are, so we're not at the same point yet in, in Britain, but uh, are people generally trusting the government more than they are in France? A little bit more. So across all four countries, uh, it seems indeed that uh, France's you know, trust is, is the most, it's at the lowest point uh, when it comes to the government. Uh, so I really feel like, especially in France, there, will, there is a need to identify an authority that will be able to transmit this message, that will have you know, this transparency that we need, this independence uh, relative to the government. Uh, I think that will be really essential. Um, but I think that overall, uh, we actually see very little variation across countries, uh, which we were very surprised about, and very uh, little regional uh, variation. For instance, in Italy, uh, we expected that actually would be much more you know, uh, difference, and that's not the case. So no matter who you're talking about, uh, whether we're talking about you know, women or men, uh, age categories, everything it all transcends all those differences. Uh, there is fairly strong consensus in terms of the usefulness of that. Yeah, so privacy, uh, Fabrice Pelbois, is it something that kind of goes out the window when you're in a situation where you're facing a, a mortal danger as we are with this COVID-19 pandemic? Definitely, just like terrorism. Uh, it's always during a crisis that you have a shift in acceptance and uh, the way uh, the government is going to control a little more of what used to be public freedom before. And this is a, not only a great crisis, but a great opportunity to uh, enter uh, in an open way, in some sort, uh, the, 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 a new world where everybody would be tracked. Because uh, there is some real uh, reason. Uh, there is, are some valid medical reason, but I really couldn't stress more that there will be other very good reason for security, for many other things that will enable those tracking apps to evolve. Uh, one of the major issues is purely medical. Is this virus something that will come back year after year like the flu? Are we going to live with those apps for a very long time? Or are those apps going to be thrown away in five or six months? That's a very, very different situation. And this is something we have to ask ourselves and ask our government right now, because the decision we're going to take about those apps today will change and affect in a very hard way our society if this virus is to be something as uh, familiar as flu is today. Severine Toussaint, how does the future seem to you? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I totally agree with this. I mean, I think we definitely need to, to think, I mean, the current situation, we're definitely not out of it, right? There is a risk of new outbreak and having actually, you know, an idea, um, collecting data uh, to understand the spread of, of contagion and p potential risk of, of a new outbreak, I think is incredibly important, but obviously also for the future of new, uh, you know, epidemics that, that could be coming. So for instance, we asked one question in our study about, uh, you know, saving data and realizing this data for to prevent future epidemics. And in fact, there is also a lot of support for a policy that would uh, consist in saving in an anonymized way all the data that was generated by the app uh, for research purposes. Okay, so a majority of people actually support that across all four countries. Uh, a majority of people think this can be anonymized, which is not the case. Uh, this cannot be anonymized. So whatever the data is, even if it's five months worth of data, and then we stop those apps, those data will not be anonymized. Uh, whatever the government tells you, it's impossible to anonymize that. Right. Well, so I think it's really... Study. You mentioned, you mentioned uh, Singapore, Fabrice Pellebois. Uh, there's also been places like Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea... Uh, how has it looked so far on that score? As of today, uh, there's something like 30 different initiatives worldwide about tracking apps all over the place. And there are 
uh, some states like, uh, well, mostly Asian states, but also Israel are pretty much ahead. Uh, when it comes to Europe, you have projects. Uh, they're actually in the process of building uh, an app and uh, you got to wonder how do you build an app without uh, specifics about the app about the way uh, data is going to be handled about the way where data is going to be shared because this is the very first thing you do when you code an app think about the data and the way it's going to be used and then you code so uh, i find it difficult to imagine that people are actually building an app and other people are thinking about those problems because those problems should be solved beforehand, theoretically. And of course, we're in a crisis. So things are going to work in a very different way. And this is quite dangerous for our freedoms tomorrow. Severin Tussa? Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to just uh, point towards a website now that exists that's just very recent. That's the uh, website of the Pan European Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing website. And uh, basically lays out a framework for GDPR compliance, for instance, uh, to be uh, to be met here. Uh, trying to understand what are the basic fundamental principles uh, that you know on which the uh, approach uh, needs to rely. So you know, privacy, voluntary pr participation being one of them. How you, how are you going to preserve anonymity? I mean, so there is a notion of anonymity vis-a-vis, -vis, like between users of the app. So that I, I think mm -hmm. is something that you know uh, people, most people actually care about, right? Is it Am I going to uh, know who got the virus, right, personally? That I think is really something that we need to ensure, and this is actually something that we can do, right? So uh, so they have a framework that they lay out, and then I invite everyone to, to look at uh, that uh, potentially could provide an architecture for every European country desiring to use such an app uh, to, to actually do that. Yeah, so th there's several points there because you, you see, uh, as Fabrice Bedouin just said, you don't have a pan-European app yet. So you're saying these could be some of the, the criteria for, for, for building one. But we do see apps already in use. Uh, in Poland, for instance, uh, there's an app they've been using now for more than a week uh, where those who are positive have to download the app or else face a fine to prove that they're remaining in confinement. Severin Toussaint, your thought on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, very different societies will have very different views in terms of the level of paternalism, for instance, you want to impose in a society. So that like cultural determinants that are very important. Norway, for instance, just said, yeah, OK, let's just have this automatically installed on people's phones, like you, you cited the case of Poland. I mean, in Asia and many countries, and they went with a very you know, strict solution here. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, uh, that's for every country to determine in, in many ways. Um, so uh, there are also other issues in terms of integration, right? Every country has different types of health services. How are we going to centralize the information? All these things are where we require a country by country response. I know where you are in the UK, they've uh, uh, deemed it legal to have a uh, tracking of people to make sure that uh, they're respecting the rules of confinement and only going out once a day. Your thoughts on that, Severine? Yeah, so again, I think this is something that needs to be brought to the public and uh, to debate, right? I think this is uh, really important. That's why I'm, I'm very happy that uh, we have this discussion about what or what are the different options uh, and what potentially uh, can actually work in the long term. Um, you know, in Asia, the rules were incredibly strict. Uh, it seemed that they helped somewhat, but um, but also this is not something that we could see in democracies uh, in uh, in Europe as uh, uh, you know culturally. I don't think this is this is something we can even consider. And what do you think of that 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 idea? Is it a good one? Um, well, I mean, I think again, like I. Um, I would want to follow the opinion of the majority in terms of you know what, what it is uh, that uh, people can support. I think that uh, when measures are very strict, um, then we have to worry that people are not going to comply uh, with orders. Um, so I think this is something that we, that needs to be taken into account, and that's why we ask the question of voluntary installation versus automatic installation because uh, because it, it needs to be sort of a team response in many ways uh, in a situation of you know. Um, crisis like this. Such an important point you're bringing up there, which is uh, uh, what do you do as opposed to uh, a hard lockdown like we've seen here in France or in Italy, or uh, a more flexible form 
of confinement, as we've seen in Germany. We can show you this report by our Berlin correspondent, Nick Spicer. They've been lining up since 6 a.m. for the test. Across the country, hospitals and clinics are working overtime. 100,000 tests are done every day in Germany, a massive program that helps prepare for the pandemic. It's obviously not the tests that save lives, he says, but very early testing does allow us to detect infections quickly, which enables us to limit the spread of the virus and keep the contamination level low. Massive tests, but also quarantines and early steps to keep people at home, all helped Germany keep its COVID-19 mortality rate at a very low level. The chancellor herself went into quarantine after treatment by an infected doctor and called on her fellow citizens to stay the course. Stick very closely to the rules, she said, and as much as you can, limit all contact with people outside your home. It's a successful strategy for the German leader. 89% of people here approve of the government's management of the crisis. For now. The confidence she inspires may not last forever, he says, because a lot can happen still. The situation can get much worse very quickly and cause enormous problems. There can be economic, social and family difficulties. For the time being, Germany has seen fewer deaths than its neighbours. But scientists and the government aren't letting their guard down, because the COVID-19 mortality rate, low as it is here, is still slowly but inevitably getting higher. Yeah, Fabrice Appelboin, the, the German strategy vis-à-vis -vis the one here in France of getting that testing done early, as early as January, and really targeting little epicenters. Well, it's like we're in mass, you have to afford it, but uh, we weren't in this situation where we could have such a strategy in France. So we had, a, a, well, obviously a third world country strategy. And uh, obviously Germany and of course, Singapore, South Korea uh, are showing the way. Uh, they are much more modern in terms of uh, how you should handle a pandemic. They have more experience. And we were not prepared at all, but I think everybody knows that by now in France. Uh, right now, we're facing a, a situation where in Europe, where Europe happens to be non-existent at the time. And um, those apps show another problem that we all show, we all knew about Europe. Every country will have a specific app because it's a specific culture. People are not willing to accept the same thing from their government from one European country to another. But still, we will have to share the data among, America, uh, among European countries if we want to handle this epidemic. Um, it's going to be very difficult to uh, both do some local app that will be acceptable and used and not uh, entice some, I don't know, public uh, um, ousting, some massive demonstration against the government. And at the same time, uh, sharing those data on a European level. Uh, I can't imagine two very different countries like uh, Hungary and, uh, uh, or Sweden and France uh, doing the same thing with their population and gathering the same data, therefore being able to share some useful data with their European counterparts. This is going to be a problem. Séverine Toussaint, uh, is this make or break for the European Union when you have just a simple thing like this about whether or not you use tracking apps Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so I totally agree, I think this is a major challenge. Uh, the initiative I was telling you about, so this PEP, uh, Panel European Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing um, Framework, I think is, uh, has a lot of potential. It won't bring all countries together uh, that I, I can foresee, but I think that it will allow at least uh, Friends, Italy has been in contact with, I think, uh, the uh, uh, developers in, in Germany, and there is actually a lot of there are a lot of conversations that maybe we haven't heard of uh, about how uh, things could be uh, implemented as a, a um, at a local uh, at a global scale. The uh, the, the German uh, version has uh, thought a lot about you know encoding of IDs that would have one component of it that would allow us to track what country the person comes from. So that, for instance, when we reopen borders and we can actually uh, have, uh, you know, some some communication centralization of the information. But at the end of the day, it, you know, the the backend will be there, but the app itself 
but because there is there are state differences in terms of you know healthcare systems, for instance, and how we're gonna you know actually um, collect this, this information about testing, right? Uh, this is going to be country based. So there are challenges here for sure that has have to be addressed in many ways. You heard of Fabrice Pelbois. Is it impossible to harmonize across Europe? Um, I think, you know, it's always a challenge of, of the European Union itself. There is a lot of heterogeneity in terms of what we can do, right? Uh, um, building a, a true consensus at the, at the EU level might, might be uh, very, very challenging. But I think, at least with a smaller set of countries, there is something that potent potentially can be achieved. And, uh, and that requires, uh, yeah, in, important discussions in terms of, of coordination for apps that already exist, then that's more challenging. But we are still at a phase, for instance, in France, where you know this is not even on the table, I think. All right. So just to remind our viewers, the reason we're talking about these apps is for confinement to be lifted, you need to have uh, the population feel safe when they walk down the street. And listening to what Séverine Toussaint just said, Fabrice Appelboin, the answer will be a two-speed Europe when it comes to uh, the rules of deconfinement? Well, uh, since those that are going to be um, really mandatory when it comes to traveling, because uh, if tomorrow I go to, uh, to Italy, uh, someone in Italy is going to ask me as a French citizen, uh, are, you, uh, are you going to harm us? And it's pretty legitimate. So there is going to have some sort of passport i guess between countries showing that uh, foreign countries that are um, not dangerous in terms of coronavirus uh, therefore uh, the the countries who will assemble together and who will share this kind of data or standard might shape something else than the, the current europe and there will definitely definitely be a subset of europe uh, it might not be the Europe uh, we uh, were seeing as a future, like a northern European country versus the southern European countries, because, well, since Spain and Italy are really much affected, uh, they're going to work hard on the problem and they'll probably be part of the solution. So it's going to be something very different from what we all expected from, um, you know, we all thought that Europe were, was going into a, a dead end and thinking about a new way of assembling a Europe. And this is going to be different uh, because of this virus. Very different because we used to have a purely economical view on Europe. And definitely this view is failing as we speak. Yeah, I, I very much agree with this. I mean, I think that, uh, for instance, the Italian case, obviously we've, we've surveyed Italians uh, in, our, in, our, in our study, and it clearly they are even more inclined to use such an app, more you know likely to say yes, I will definitely com comply with safe isolation measures. But you know the Italian case now, right, might be the French case uh, further down the road if we don't do anything, right? So uh, so there is really something here in terms of building uh, you know a team and having communication there uh, going on because we can all learn from each other. Uh -huh. Yeah, and we saw with uh, South Korea that they were spooked by 2015 when they had a coronavirus outbreak then. That's why they were ahead of the curve uh, this time and learned the lessons of the past. Um, and uh, here in Europe, the future is unwritten. Uh, that study, uh, Severin Toussaint, that you participate in is in the magazine Science. I want to thank you for being with us from Oxford in the UK. I want to thank the confined Fabrice Pelboin for being with us uh, from Paris. Thank you for joining us here in this lockdown edition of the show.